Those, hey, Merry Christmas. So glad you could join us today. For you that are not here that, that uh, we miss, we love you. And for you that can't come, we also miss you and love you as well. I pray God's richest blessing was on you during this holiday season and that Jesus was your centerpiece. Amen. How many know it's all about Christ and not only just his birth, but his death, burial, and his resurrection Amen. and that we find true worship uh, with him. And that is the subject that I'm on right now is worship. One of the things that we find from the beginning of time in Genesis is that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. I guarantee you, if God came to your early morning, you're going to be a worshiper. I don't think you're going to be a person that's going to try to tell God what to do. I don't think you're going to be a person that's going to stand there and go, oh, did you see this? When you know he already did. You, know, you can't impress God. Amen. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, and no matter how eloquent you say it or do it, it's not going to impress God. Why? Because God, hallelujah, is God, and He sees it all, knows it all, has seen the end from the beginning. He knows exactly what you did before you did it. Amen? You know, and I can only imagine Adam in the cool of the day wanting to know God, wanting to get closer to God, wanting to hear more about what, what he had on his heart and what he desired and what he wanted. And, and you know, we see that with Jesus when he died, before he died upon the cross in the garden. He says, not my will, but thy will be done. See, even Jesus himself said, I want God to be exalted. I want God to be seen. I want God to be glorified. I want God to be the centerpiece of everything. Amen. We see all the way through history uh, in, in the Bible book of Genesis that, you know, God created us to not only have fellowship with him and to worship him and to admire him and to honor him, but we see man didn't do that. Matter of fact, that grieved God, Bible, the Bible says, that he even created man because he was wicked in all their ways. Why were they wicked? Because they stopped looking to God. They stopped worshiping God. They stopped fellowship with God. And they decided to do what they wanted to do. And as a result of doing what they wanted to do, God had to destroy them all. Do you know that we're in the same system just like that? Because he said as it was in the days of Noah, it will also be in ours. That people will begin, as, as, as we read this morning in our Bible study, that they'll be lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. And the Bible says, to, from such, turn away. Why? Because they are in a destructive path and you don't want to jump on course with them. Amen? Oh, we can pray for them. We can encourage them. We can try to lead them to the things of God. But let me tell you what, saints, be careful on who you associate with. Be careful on who you run with, because let me tell you what, not everybody's going down the same path you're on. Amen? And it's so important that we see this. You know, one of the things that I love in my life is the fact that I get to worship God. I get to spend time with God. I get to hear His voice. I get to experience His heartbeat. I get to listen to His breath. I get to listen to His Word. I get to enjoy all the attributes of God at the levels that I can understand Him. Amen? Amen. And I thank God that He even gives me those moments to do that. Amen? That's why in my life, you see me constantly smile. Somebody says, you always smile. I trust God. I have a relationship with God that causes me to be excited about life. Oh, but do you have problems? Oh, yeah, let's see. Um, I had all my teeth knocked out probably three months after I got saved. Um, I had a bad accident that tried to kill me after I got saved. Uh, let's see. I've broken my shoulder, broken my wrist. I've twisted my ankle. I've had a sickness that tried to come upon me. And you know what? Every one of those things that occurred, whether at work or whether in serving the Lord, I was serving the Lord by giving myself in representation of Him. You know, all of the falls that I've had and all the breaks that I've had, I was serving God by helping people. Amen. It wasn't me out there trying to make a living for me. It was me helping people get closer to God. And as a result, trouble came, tribulation came. But let me tell you, God has delivered me out of them all. Amen. I can still worship. I can still turn to Him. I can still glorify Him. Why? Because my walk with God is not determined what man does. My walk with God is determined by what He did. Amen. I mean, I think praise and worship should be your lifestyle. You know, as, Tom, as, as A.J. said that morning when he called me up, you heard me several weeks ago at 3 o'clock in the morning, he says, I just want to be a praiser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You know, three o'clock in the morning, I wanted to slap him. I didn't want to praise, but you know what? I have never lost that view. I have never lost what he said to me because my wife and I all the time will go around and once in a while to just pop out. I just want to be a praiser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. And I hope you'll grab a hold of that too because God created us to praise. God created us to worship. God created us to be in His presence. God created us to experience His love. God created us for this so that the world can know Him. It's an opportunity to express God. You know, I, I like what Kenneth Hagin said. It's an expression of gratitude and for thanking Him for what He's done and what He's yet to do. Amen. When you worship, you're not only thanking Him for what He's done, you're thanking Him for what He's still going to do. Right. Amen. It's so important we understand that. There was a missionary years ago that was praying, and he was, I believe it was South Africa or Nigeria, and he was praying, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and, he prayed and God just didn't move. So he prayed and he prayed and he prayed some more and God still didn't move. How many has ever felt that way? And so he went, he had to do a trip on doing an evangelistic outreach to another church and he was there and he got there early and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and it just felt dry. So he prayed and he prayed and he prayed some more and still felt dry. And all of a sudden he looked up and above the door he said, try praising. And the moment he began to praise God, he activated all the prayers that he was believing for. Why? Because it brought him into the presence of God. And in the presence of God, all things are possible. Amen? You know, prayer and praise, are simu- you know, they work together. Amen? When I pray to God, I praise for the, for the results. Why? Because that's faith in action. I'm not just asking Him to do things. I am positioning myself for Him to do something. Amen? And I think as Christians, we need to learn to position ourselves so that God can do something. Amen? You know, Kenneth Hagin said it this way, prayer acts, praise takes. I'm going to say that again. Prayer asks, prayer takes. Why? Because when you're asking you're in position to take what God has for you. Amen? He says, prayer believes, but praise ex- ex- exclaims the gratitude and thanksgiving of receiving it before it ever comes. Amen. Saints, we can't afford not to be praisers. We can't afford not to be worshipers. No matter what's going on, let me tell you what, what's going on should never dictate your circumstances. Never. The joy of the Lord should be your strength. You should be a praiser all the time. That should be the centerpiece of your heart. Amen? I love it. I get up every morning with a song in my heart. Now, don't ask me to sing it. Two things will happen. Number one, the person who hears my voice will probably leave. And the second thing is, is that if I try to sing it, I lose the thought of how to say it in the way that it's being sung. Because when the Spirit is moving, it's pure. He's real. He's, he's, you know, he just knows exactly how to do it. And let me tell you what, I don't want this and this to work. I want what's going on on the inside to work. Amen. So I wake up with a song in my heart. We learned in John 4, verse 23 and 24, he says that we're going to worship the Father in spirit of truth. He said the hour is coming and now is when a true worshiper, say true worshiper. See, a true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is looking. Where are my worshipers? Oh, there's a worshiper. There's a worshiper. There's a worshiper. And how many know if He's looking for them and He finds them, that means He's there? How many know if God is there, all things are possible? Amen? Amen? So he says, he's looking for one that will worship in spirit of truth. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. See, we've got to get past the outward expression of a song. We've got to get past the outward expression of a guitar or a piano. We've got to get into the inward expression of the spirit. That when I sing a song to you, whether I like the way it sounds or if I like the way it's played, has nothing to do with worship. It has everything to do with what's going on on the inside in your heart. You know, when, when somebody says, I, I can imagine we're going to get to the heaven one day and somebody's going to go praise the Lord and everybody's just going to praise. 
Come on. Somebody's going to say hallelujah and everybody's going to say hallelujah. <laughs> Why? Because everything that we are and everything that we have is due to Him. And the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise Him. I don't know, it might be thousands of years of just saying hallelujah. <laughs> it's okay with me. Oh, I know, we want more, but let me tell you what, just to stand in His presence, see His face, and say hallelujah, that might be a long, drawn-out hallelujah. Yeah, Jesse said one day, he said, I, I think the day when I get to heaven, I'm going to fall on my face and just cry out and say, I made it! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, one of our foundational scriptures that we've been using a lot in this series is, is now, in the church that was in Antioch, there was certain prophets, teachers. It's going to start with Barnabas, and it's going to go down to Saul. Now, listen to this. In Antioch, there were prophets, there were teachers. Do you see that? Prophets and teachers, right? These are men and women of God that are seasoned. And they understood that the whole purpose of their call, and you'll see this in the next verse. Let's go to verse 2. And he says, as, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate me and Barnabas and Saul for the work in which I have called them. It's amazing that when you see these seasoned men of God worshiping, ministering, that's what that word means, ministered to the Lord, God showed up. I don't know about you, but you know, God isn't going to show up just because you show up. God's going to show up because you're inviting Him in. God's going to show up because you're asking Him to come where you are. Amen? You know, I don't come to your house unless you call me or ask me to come. Or unless I've got a matter and I call you and say, I need to see you. <laughs> But the reality is, is that everybody usually loves an invitation. Well, how much more is God? He wants an invitation to come to your house. When you minister to God, when you worship God, He wants to come. He desires that. How many here love it when somebody compliments you or praises you or tell you what a great job you did or, man, you know, you, you endured that and you went through that? How much, how good does that feel? How much more when you start telling God, oh, thank you, God, that you delivered me through this. Thank you, God, that you helped me with this. Thank you, God, that you're my God. Thank you, God, that you saved me. Come on. They ministered to the Lord. They ministered to God. Amen. And the Bible says that God showed up. And the second thing that we see, he spoke. I don't know about you, but I want to hear God. I don't want to just be a, a, a give me Jimmy kind of a person asking God to always move in my stuff. I want to move in his stuff. Amen? I want to call up on him and see him answer. Well, how do you do that? Minister to him. Quit being always a person of prayer. I'm just pray for this and pray for that and pray for that and pray for this and pray for them and pray for this over there and pray for more money and pray for more stuff and pray for more help and pray for my brother and pray for my sister and pray for my neighbor, pray for my boss, pray for my finances, pray for my next house, pray for my next car, pray for my... I mean, I don't know about you, but if you keep knocking on my door asking those kind of things, I'm probably going to say, speak to the hand because the ears ain't listening. Come on, come on. I wonder how many times God has to literally just put up his head and say, you know, you've been on this roll for a long time. It's time you get a change and realize, I just want to spend time with you. I just want to love on you. I just want you to know how much. I care about you. You know, if all it was that I wanted from my wife, give me, 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 how many know after a while she's going to say, I got something you can take? Amen. We've got to get the right mindset here about our relationship with God. He showed up. Say, He showed up. God spoke. And then He began to give them directions on what Paul and Barnabas was supposed to do. What were they doing? Ministering to God. Worshiping God. They weren't there asking God, oh God, what do you want me to do next? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? 
No, they were ministering to God. To minister to God is to admire, to lift up, to honor, to glorify. Amen. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be worshipers. Ministering to God and ministering from, from God to the world. Amen? What, what is the first thing he tells us in fulfillment of the commandments? Love God with all your heart, all your strength, and all your might. That's worship. That's intimacy. What did Jesus do when the disciples asked him, teach us how to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, will be, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is that? Ministry, worshiping God. It isn't asking for things. Oh, yeah, they went on and said, give us you know, our daily bread and help forgive those who have done evil against us. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the glory forever and ever, you know, amen. You know, the reality is, is that it wasn't about them. It was about him. Jesus set the example of worship. Set the example of ministering to God. Set the example of, of ministering in spirit and truth. What does it mean to minister in spirit and truth? It means to be sincere. Is your worship real? You know, sometimes when I worship, it doesn't feel real. Anybody ever do that? Just doesn't feel real, real. So what do you do? Press in. If it's not working for you, find something that is. Oh God, I just worship you. I just honor you. I can't really go along with the song right now because it's just not helping me get there. But I know what I can do to get there. You know, so many Christians go to church for entertainment. We're not here to entertain you. We're here to entertain Him. And to worship Him. And to lift Him up. It, what it means to worship in spirit of truth. It means to walk in integrity and truthfulness. You know, truthfulness is, God, I'm really having a struggle worshiping today. Help me enter in. It's a desire of the heart to go deeper in God. Even in the midst of your struggle. Do you know that it's okay to doubt? Oh, but we're supposed to walk in faith. Well, let me tell you what. I walk in faith, but when doubt comes, I just turn it over to faith and worship in God. Does that mean I can't doubt? No, there's going to be times I'm going to doubt. That's real. It's real to get real with God. But when you get real with God, turn it into worship. And let His presence come and change it. Amen? I believe with all my heart, one of the greatest things about worship is an invitation for God to come. We're saying, God, I want you in my midst. I want you in my life. I want to give you what you deserve, not just what I want. Amen? Acts chapter 16, verses 22 through 24 this is, you know, Paul in prison, and it says, Then a multitude rose and came up against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes. Now remember, they're getting ready to get in trouble because they're worshipers of God. They're servants of the Most High God. They, they just cast out a demon of a woman that had divination, and it took away a man's livelihood because he made money off that divination. And as a result, they cast it out in the name of Jesus, and it ticked everybody off, including the religious people. Why? Because there's money to be given. You know, if a guy's making money, he can give a great offering. Come on. Everybody's going to get benefited, and they lost their, their, their value. And the Bible says they tore off their clothes. So think about this. Paul is stripped down now because they literally ripped off his clothes. I mean, how would you feel if all of a sudden somebody came in and just ripped your clothes off? Pretty naked, wouldn't you? Yeah. Look at this. Magistrates tore off their clothes, commanded them to be beaten with rods. So now they've got rods and they're being beaten, right? Uh-huh. When they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison, fastened their feet in stocks. Now, think about this. They're preaching Jesus. They'd be condemned. Their clothes are torn. They've been beaten. I mean, no, they've got not only stripes, but they've probably got broken open skin. They've got bruised bones, bruised uh, muscles. I mean, they're hurting. 
And he tells them, says, put them in stocks, chain them up, and put them in the lowest part of the jail. Now, you have to understand, in those days, the Roman jails that they were put into had low ceilings. So they couldn't stand up. Matter of fact, it was known that because it was the lower parts of the city, the cisterns, the stool, ran through the jailhouse. Wait a minute. Stripped naked, beaten, sores open, cuts, bleeding wounds, put in stocks, put in a place you can't even stand up, and if that's not enough, stool is running through my cell. Most Americans wouldn't make it. (laughs) Right? And look what happens. Verse, uh, chat, verse 25. But at the midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. They weren't just asking for help, asking for deliverance, asking to get the pains taken away, asking them to be released, even though those could have been some of their prayers. They turned it into praise. And they began to praise hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Let me tell you, you're an example to others. When you're going through a trial, when you've been beaten, when you're down and when somebody's treating you wrong, just turn it to praise. You know, we have a motorcycle wreck. What did they do? They turned it to prayer and then adoration for those who prayed. Whew. Are you seeing this? Hallelujah. And listen to this. The prisoners were listening to them. Go to the next verse. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but there's freedom in worship. There's freedom in inviting the presence of God in the house. There's freedom that when you've got your adversary against you and you choose not to follow your adversary, but to follow God, hallelujah, everything is subject to change. And they begin to see this change at that midnight hour. They begin to cry out and they begin to call upon God. Now, Paul had many experiences of being in jail. Matter of fact, we'll we'll learn in a few minutes when he was in Philippi. uh, Jail, he didn't have this kind of experience. Oh, yeah, he still went through a struggle, still was put down. He was still, you know, in a place where he couldn't stand up. He still rode out of the jail of Philippi. But he didn't have one of these major experiences that he experiences now. But he did not forget the experience that he had. So that when he went to the next place, he was still a worshiper. He was still a praiser. He didn't allow his circumstances to stop him from rejoicing even when he didn't feel like it. Even when the circumstances were were against him. Because he knew the only way that he could get through it was with God. Total trust in God. You know, Paul's not saying that this is going to be the key that's going to unlock your door. But it's going to be the place where God's presence is going to come to help you through it. And I don't know about you, but we need a lot of help in this next year. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me that next year is going to be darker than the year that we've had. But light is going to shine brighter for those who are in His presence. Amen. I tell you, saints, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 4. Now remember, he's in jail. But listen to what he says. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He said, worship God. Let me get this right. Worship God. He says it twice because he really wants you to get it. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Do you remember when he was in jail earlier and he was in prison? He was beaten and he was dealing with all that stuff. As they began to pray and worship, not only did it affect their circumstances that unlock all the doors, But it affected all of those who were in the jailhouse too. Why? Because all the doors came open. All the shackles were broken. It's not just about you. It's about others around you. So let your gentleness be known to men. What is he saying? Be a worshiper. Be a worshiper. Because it's going to make a difference on those around you. And the Lord is at hand. What happens? God shows up. If you're a worshiper, God shows up. Why? Because God created worship. For you to worship him, not for you to worship you. See, the moment that worship was perverted, the one who perverted it was cast out of heaven. And he has no eternal hope in heaven, but in hell. 
The moment you turn worship on you is the moment you set yourself up for destruction. That's why I always say, quit listening to all the other types of music that's out there because the music was created to worship God. And if you're listening to the other types of music, I feel sorry for you because it's not making a place for God, but it is making a place for something else. And it's not where you want to be. Oh, and I know people that would come against me on that, Christians that would come against me on that. There are Christian songs out there right now, I'm telling you, saints, don't listen to. There's a lot of songs out there that's ungodly, not scriptural. Amen? Oh, it's got a great tune, sounds good, great entertainment. But we're not here for entertainment, we're here to worship God. We're here to glorify God. Amen? Look what he said in 4.9, he says, the Lord is at hand. So let your gentleness be known, for the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, in prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a form of worship, a form of praise. Amen? Let your request be made known to God, and what happens? The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Man, you're going to have protection. Oh, I know. You know, when I was sick and they told me I'd be down for 18 months, I was still a praiser. I still said, God, I believe your word. God, I know that by your stripes I'm healed. When I, when I had my teeth knocked out, I'd go in the bedroom and literally until the medicine kicked in or the ibuprofen kicked in, I mean, I would be crying my head off with my head underneath my pillow going, God, I believe you. I trust you. I know that you're here. I know that you're going to get me through. Oh, I know it's painful, but God, you carried the pain for me and by his stripes I'm healed. I worshiped him with it. I wasn't trying to get him to do something. I was trying to enter into his presence of what he's already done. And we saw a miracle, didn't we, brother? An absolute bona fide miracle of God raising me up out of that sick bed as a result of that. Amen. Saints, we've got to become worshipers again. The Lord is at hand. And he said we need to continue in prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, making our requests known to God. And what does he say? Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there's any virtue and if there's, there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. This is what he's telling us to do. This is where our heart should be. This is where our meditation should be. I praise you despite my sir. I praise you despite that person. I praise you despite that evil thing that I had to go through. Amen. Come on. We're walking out the end time presence of God to bring people to Christ. This is our call. When you got saved, your life ended. And Christ's life began. Amen. Amen. I believe in Acts 16 that we talked about earlier. We're going to look at verse number 26. It says, Suddenly there was a great earthquake and the foundations of the prisons were shaken and immediately the doors were opened. Everyone's chains were loosed. I'll say that again. Everyone's chains were loosed. Say, we're loosed. What were they doing to get everyone's chains loosed? Praying and praising God. Results happen when you pray and praise God. Look at 27 and following. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from the sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prison prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He knew as a guard that if these prisoners were gone, his life was over. Because his job was to make sure they stayed there. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Hmm, I love this. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Man, not only, not only did Paul and Silas experience an earth-shaking experience in their trouble. I mean, it didn't change their wounds. It didn't change their feelings. It didn't change what they had been through. What did it change? It changed the atmosphere because of the presence of God came into the place, shook the foundation, and began to do things in other people's hearts. But Paul didn't run. He didn't try to get out. Paul knew that he was on a course with God and he was going to stay on that course no matter what. Amen? Amen? So what do I need to be, do to be saved? And they said, 
Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. It, it affects everybody. It causes others to come to Christ. Amen? Amen. Saints, you've got to understand this. The Lord is at hand when you praise. The Lord is in your midst when you worship. The Lord wants to be a part of your life. That's why He created worship. Why? Because worship breaks open the heavens and causes God to come down into your midst. Well, you can experience Him. Amen? See, I want to say this. Your pain and your suffering is not what this is all about. So many Christians are living a life for God when everything is good. But when the pains and the struggles and the discontents or the problems come with people or come with circumstances, then what we do is we allow that to be a centerpiece instead of God. You know, saints, it's not about the pain. It's not about the suffering. It's not about what people or other things that happen in your life does. It's a heart issue. Worship is a heart issue. God is trying to get the heart issue right. What is the heart issue? Trusting God. It's all about trusting God. I want to read a few scriptures. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord. Lean not upon your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways and He will direct your path. He said trust, lean, and acknowledge. That's your part. He didn't say go figure it out. Go beat them up. Go take a, you know, come on. He said trust, lean, and acknowledge and God will. I don't know about you, but I sure love God directing my path over me. Amen? Uh, Psalms 28, 7 says, The Lord is my strength, my shield, and Him my heart trusts. Matthew 6, 25-33, He says, I take care of the birds of the air, the lilies of the field. How much more will I? Have you seen a starving bird other than the one the cat got? Have you ever seen lilies even in a dry place blossom? How much more will He take care of you if you're a worshiper and a praiser of God? Amen? Psalms 9.10 Those who know your name will put their trust in you. Romans 8.28 All things work together for those who what? Who love God. Psalms 112 verse 7. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm. Trusting in the Lord. Isaiah 26 3. You keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed upon you. Because he trusts in you. Perfect peace. Psalms 37 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. And he will act. Are you seeing this? It's not a, a, a tribulation issue. It's not a hurt issue. It's not a circumstance issue. It's a heart issue. Amen? You know the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you need to keep your heart right so your praise is right. Because if your praise is right, His presence is there. Amen? So the question I have to ask, do you trust God? Do you know that He's with you always? Do you know His peace will comfort you? Do you know that He will get you through? Then you've got to be a praiser. Amen? I mean, you know, you took that long trip, I guess, out to California one time. And man, it's a long run. But how many know when you get there, it's like, because oh, that's a long run. I mean, some people try to do it, you know, in what, 22 hours? Okay, well, anyway, you know that when you get there, you know that there's a release. Well, how much more when you begin to praise Him, the release that comes when you're in your trial or in your circumstance and you need God to show up? Amen? Praise and worship is vital to our lives. Philippians 4.13 said, All things are possible for those who murmur, complain, and question God. Oh, is that what it says, Brian? Oh, all things are possible for those who believe God. Do you believe God? Well, look, look at this scripture I want to take you through for a few minutes. In 2 Chronicles 20, and I'm going to open up my Bible because I'm going to read it for a minute. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Hallelujah. 
And this is the story of Jehoshaphat, and we've, we've talked about it before, but I just want to break it down for you for a few minutes to help you come to a place to where you can really grab a hold of, kind of like, you know, what Cindy said this morning about her, her mom hearing the word and said, I didn't know that was there. Well, I want you to know this is there. Amen? And in 2 Chronicles 20, the Bible said it happened after that that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came into battle against Jehoshaphat. How many know we have a battle? Every day there's a battle going on in one way, fashion, or form. Would you agree? Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are Hazon, Tamar, which is an En Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed the fast through, throughout all of Judah. Now, who was Judah? Was Judah? Judah was known as praisers. Judah was known as a people really after God's heart. You know, David was from the tribe of Judah. He was a praiser. He was a worshiper. Amen. And Jehoshaphat saw what was coming and he admitted, I'm fearful of this. I don't like what I'm about to face, but I do know what to do. And so Jehoshaphat began to do it and proclaimed a fast in all of Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask for help from the Lord and from the cities of Judah. They came to seek what? What were they doing? They're worshiping God. They're inquiring of God. They're asking of God. But I promise you they're coming with praises too because you're going to see that. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God of heaven? And do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? They knew that God could do this. They even told him, said, I know that you are this. And then he says, are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to your descendants Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your names, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, famine, will we stand before the temple and in your presence for your name is in this temple and cry out to you in our afflictions and you will hear and save? They said, we know the process. We know that, first of all, there's going to be tribulation and trouble, but we know who to call upon because aren't you the God that rules the nations? Aren't you the God that delivers us out? Aren't you the God that delivered Abraham and all of them too? So we know you as that. And even though that might come and bring these other things against us, judgment, pestilence, and famines, in verse 9, he said, but it's your name that's in the temple. It's you we cry out to. It's you that we hear, and it's you that saves us. They knew exactly what to do. They knew exactly were to go and it says verse 10 and now here are the people of Ammon Moab and Mount Seir whom you you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt but they turned from them and did not destroy them you remember they had an opportunity to fight against them but God said wait a minute you're going to leave them alone because there's another time coming where we're going to deal with this you know there's you need to pick your battles Amen. amen there's some battles you just need to leave alone and put in the hands of God Amen. Verse 11. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. He says, wait a minute, God, you gave us this stuff. They have no right to take it. Isn't that what he's saying? But they're coming anyway. Come on, the government's coming. The people are coming. Gross darkness is coming. Why? To try to take away what belongs to us. This, saints, you need to get a hold of this. This belongs to us. Salvation, deliverance, and living in the presence of God with all of His benefits belong to us. And they're trying to take it away, just as they tried to here. Verse 12. Our God, you will not judge, our God, you, you not ju- will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes... I don't know what to do in this system of darkness that's coming, but I do know what to do. Put my eyes on Him, the author and finisher of my faith, the one that is able to bring me through, the one that I worship, the one that I adore. Amen? Now all Judah, praisers, with their little children, their wives and their children, stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the Jael, the son of Matthias, 
Mathaniah, the Levite, the sons of Asaph, and in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all of you of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid, be afraid do not be dismayed, but because of this great multitude, for the battle was not yours, but God. Amen. Now, whose battle is it when you go through a battle? Absolutely. Absolutely. Without His presence in your midst, you lose. The battle's the Lord's. Wait a minute. How's the battle of the Lord? Well, when you're sick, who heals you? When you're finding financial difficulty, who provides for you? When somebody needs salvation, who saves you? When you need healing, who does it? So where's the battle? What's our part? Worshiping and trusting God. Being a praiser. Our part isn't trying to go out there and beat the air and get everybody to, you know, submit to us. Our part is to lift up God so He can come into the atmosphere of the air and change it. Amen? Amen. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up. I mean, He said, this is going to happen. They're going to come. And they're going to come from all over. And there's three of them. So you, and look, verse 17. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself. Worship positions you for the battle. Amen? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Didn't we not say earlier the Lord was at hand when they began to worship and pray? Right? O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. Whew. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head down, uh, his face to the ground and all of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord and what? They're getting ready to go to battle. Maybe, maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe you're having a difficulty in your life. Maybe there's something that's not quite coming through. Turn it to worship. Turn it to thanking Him for it. Praising Him for it. Glorifying Him for it. Well, I haven't seen it. Well, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not. That's, see, when you're worshiping, you're in faith. You're trusting God. You're believing God. He's going to come through. So they rose early in the morning, verse 20, went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood up and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of, Jeru inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and he shall be established. Believe as prophets, and you shall pro What did we just read earlier in Acts chapter 13? All the prophets and all the teachers were standing before God, ministering to God. And what happened? God showed up. God spoke. God gave them direction. Saints, we can't afford in this last day, especially in this gross darkness, to not be a worshiper. Worship invites the presence of God. Worship not only invites His presence, but it brings the Spirit of God into your midst. And then when you need direction, He'll tell you what to do. That's exactly what happened here. Verse 21. And when they had consulted with the people and appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of His holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah and they were defeated. Saints, worship defeats your enemy. I mean, we're too busy trying to proclaim, cast it out, drive it out, you know, blab it out. No, let's worship it out. The battle's the Lord's. Oh, that doesn't mean that you can't stand in the Word and speak to mountains because the Bible says you can. But as you speak to that mountain, become a worshiper and watch it move. I, I'll never forget when uh, Paul Crouch said that there was a mountain that interfered with the receiver of the TBN station when they started it. So they stood up and they began to rebuke the mountain. And you said, God, we could have the face of a mustard seed and speak to that mountain and it would move. And immediately they went to praising God. They don't know what happened. They don't know how the, if the mountain moved or what, but all of a sudden their signal was perfect and they've never lost it since. Come on, saints. God is able. Amen. If you read on, you'll find that as they, as they went to battle and they come up over the hill where the battle was supposed to be done, uh, one of two things scholars say happened. Either angels showed up and 
wiped them all out, or the Spirit of God showed up, turned them on each other, and they killed themselves. All three nations that came against them were dead. The Bible says that when they came up over the mountain and they looked down in the valley and they saw all the dead people for three days, they picked up so much spoil, so much goods that most of them couldn't carry it all. I don't know about you, but being a worshiper will provide for you. Amen. It'll bring things that you weren't able to bring for yourself. Amen. It's so important that you become a what? Remember, remember Abraham? It was accounted unto him as righteousness because he... He what? He believed. He trusted. He relied upon. Wait a minute. Abraham came out of Haran with his father that was a false worshiper. And God says, Abraham, leave everything you got. It was Abram at the time. Leave everything you got and go where I tell you to go. And I'll make you the father of a multitude. As the number of the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. Wait a minute. It was just Abram. He had no kids yet. But God made him a promise. And he trusted God. He believed God. And because he believed God, he received what God told him he would have. Isn't that good? When we believe and trust God, the battle is the Lord. And we'll be able to stand and we'll be able to worship. And we'll be able to see the victory of God in our midst. I believe in this last hour, we're going to need worshipers in the house. I believe one of the things about Enoch that was so awesome, the Bible said, and he pleased God and he was taken. Yes, he was a worshiper. He didn't allow his circumstances or what was going on around him to dictate his life. He worshiped God. And how many know true worshipers in the last day, I think one day is all of a sudden God's going to say, oh, they've had enough. It's over. I want to be one of those. See, the other five virgins that were unfaithful probably weren't true worshipers because they were busy just doing their stuff until the master came. Right. I want to be a true worshiper ready for his coming. Amen. Let me ask you, if the king of the universe walked in right now, would you worship? <laughs> he's coming. Yes, he and the Bible says he's looking for those who worship. Right. It's spirit and truth. This is vital for this end time move of God. This is vital, guys, and I hope you really get a hold of this. Amen? The Bible says, and you can write this down, 2 Chronicles 5, 13 and 14 says, that as they began to sing and put the praisers out there and began to worship God, the glory of the Lord came in so strong that they couldn't even stand up and minister because they were in the presence of God. Those are the days I look forward to, that we just fall on our faces and just let God be God. And it may be a time of silence where nobody says anything. I don't know if I'll probably say a word if I'm standing or actually laying on the floor before God. You know, Jesse says, I made it. I don't even know if I can get those words out. Just the thought of being there in the presence of Almighty God. Amen. What happened in Acts 2? They were in one accord. They were worshiping. That, uh, that word accord means to be in a, a piano note, being in harmony. It's a tune. It's a worship. They were in worship. And guess what? The presence of God showed up, filled them with the Holy Ghost, tongues of fire, and they went out doing great and marvelous things for God. When you're a worshiper, great and mighty things follow. Amen? David said in Psalms 22, verse 3, You are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Enthroned. What does that mean? Wherever God's people exalt His name, He is ready to manifest His kingdom power. Amen. Hallelujah. We need to make a place for God. And how do we do that? In worship. Somebody said, I heard this say one time, I preached on this years ago, and they said, well, you're just trying to manipulate God. Uh, I beg to differ with you. I'm trying to align myself up with God. <laughs> I'm not manipulating God. I'm just doing what He wants me to do. He created us to worship Him. Amen? See, the power of God and the presence of God really is a privilege to me that He would even show up. But think about that. I worship God and He shows up. It's a privilege. Amen. 
David said in Psalms 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually out of my mouth. David said in my whole life, that's what I'm going to do. If I was to say anything to you about the end time and where you're at, be a, pra be a praiser and worshiper. Right. Maybe you haven't been, but start now. It'll change your life. Amen? Amen. Look at verses 6 and 8 on that same chapter. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. What did he do? He cried out. The angel of the Lord encamps around all of those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Worship shows your trust. You know, everything may be going good and you come to church and you worship God. That's easy. But how about when everything is bad? Are you still a worshiper? You don't feel good. Had a bad week. Things just didn't go right. Finances haven't come in. I just don't feel like it. Wait a minute. It's not about your feelings. It's about your heart. Do you really love God the way God loves you? Do you really give God what God deserves? Because let me tell you, He's given us a whole lot. Amen. Now, can I say it this way? Especially in America, we have been a blessed people. I mean, we have been a blessed people. Look at 17 through 22. And I'm going to try to land this plane here this morning. This is David continuing on. It says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all yes, their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and saves such as has a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all, come on, he guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. I just want to worship him. I don't know what you want to do. I don't know what you want to do online, but I know this. Worship is the centerpiece of making an invitation to God and says, come, Lord God, I need you. I want you in my midst. Amen. David said, Psalm 1611, in your presence is the fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David quoted that uh, in the Psalms, but Acts 2, Peter quoted it. Showing you that it still works today. It's not just an Old Testament philosophy. It's a New Testament principle. Amen. Saints, you were called to, for a sacrifice of praise for the fruit of your lips. Let's look at this scripture. This is good. Hebrews 13, 15. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is what? Do you think of your lips as a... Uh, a peach tree. What is a peach tree supposed to do? Produce peaches, right? So listen, he says here, continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God with what? Our lips, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. He says, you want to have a harvest? You want to produce some good fruit? Sacrifice some praise so that God can bring it. Sacrifice it. Be willing to open your mouth even when you don't feel like opening your mouth. Continue to allow the fruit of God's presence to manifest for you. I think we heard it earlier. Vine's bringing forth from the ground. It's coming up. It's breaking through and it's bringing fruit. I'm telling you, y'all preached my sermon today. In worship and in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And it was all because you made a melody in your heart. And if we could come every service and make a melody in our heart, can you imagine the kind of services we could have? Oh, let's take it even a step farther. Can you imagine all of God's people leaving all their cares, every disgusting thing that you're bothered by, 
outside that door and you come in and you decide the only thing I want to do is worship God, what do you think might happen? Oh, well, let's take it farther. What about leaving it all outside your house? And going in and being a worshiper. What about leaving it all outside in your car when you go into work and you're going to be a worshiper? What about going into Walmart even though they got high prices and you forget about all of it and you go in just being a worshiper? God will show up. Miracles will happen. Glory will be revealed. Lives will be changed. Hearts will be mended. And I guarantee you, (laughs) you'll position yourself not only for the presence of God, but the results of what he brings with it. Amen. God wants to be in your presence. He created you so that he could have fellowship with you. That's his desire. Amen. Psalms 100, 1 through 5. I love what David said here. This is my closing scripture. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Come on, why don't you just shout? Come on, why don't you just lift your voice up and shout unto the Lord. Amen. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. And He who has, come on, made us and not we ourselves. (coughs) We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. (laughs) <laughs> enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise <laughs> be thankful to him and bless his name for the lord is good his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations would you be a praiser would you be a worshiper as we move towards this next year coming will you realize that when darkness comes all you've got to do is turn it to god I'm so excited about you today, God. I know that there's some impossible stuff set before me, but you're a God of the impossible. And in your presence is fullness of joy. And you said that if I will praise you, you'll come. If I will worship you, you'll fill the house. And Father God, today we do. We worship you and we just ask you to fill this house. Fill this house with your glory. Fill this house with your presence. Fill this house with your love so that, Father, everyone around us can experience you. We worship you today. We glorify you today. And see, the reason why I turned away from you is because I'm not worshiping with you. I'm worshiping with him. And if you choose to join in, you can have the benefits too. You choose not to join in, you can have what you've already gotten. Amen? The whole purpose of worship is to show God how appreciative you are to all that he's done. He saved you. How many here has ever had a healing? all over the house how many here remembers when they got saved and they were a mess yeah yeah (laughs) i'm sorry brother i'm not putting no names behind it because nobody can see you but we all know (laughs) but praise god what he did for you Praise God what He's done for you. Praise God what He's doing for you. And praise God for the things He's yet to do. Because our God never changes. He's the same yesterday as He is today as He will be forever. And let me tell you, if God never changes, He don't want you to change. Because the reason why He created you is to be a praise and a worshiper. Hallelujah to the King of kings and Lord of lords who is able to get you from A to B. I'm telling you from the, end, from the beginning to the end so that you can see His full glory and it's going to come because you have set yourself apart to be a worshiper and as a worshiper he fills the house and when God's in the house nothing is impossible amen Amen. can we give him some praise this morning I'm honored to be a servant of the most high God I'm honored to bring your word to your people. And I ask God that you would instill in their hearts, whether here or whether online, that God, they would become worshipers of you. And Father, they would turn off the elements of the world and turn on the elements of heaven. And for you said, as it is in heaven, it'll be upon earth. And that Father, we would begin to see this outpouring 
of your spirit in this last day for your kingdom and for your glory. I believe, God, we're stepping into it. Many of the prophets said that within the next several months, we'll see an outpouring of God's Pentecost again. Uh, major, major moves of God and souls will come into his kingdom. But understand this, that when all of this happens, the end follows. We don't have time to waste. We've got to be worshipers in this last hour. We've got to be praisers in this last hour. Because there's a world out there that needs him. Because remember, it's not about you. It's about him. And Father, we thank you for those online that have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And if you've not done that, it's really simple. Open up your heart and say, Jesus, come and be Lord of my life. Not just Savior, not just Deliverer. Because remember, you can't save yourself. He's the only one who can. But if you invite him into your heart and ask him to be the Lord of your heart, that means he reigns, he rules. Then the Bible says he, because he came, he died, and he rose for your sins. And you can be free and walk in a new life. And if you've done that today, also ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit because you need the leadership of God in your life. And as, he, as you do that, I promise you, your life will be transformed. You'll never be the same. And then also find you a good Bible and a Bible-believing church that's willing to train you to be a disciple of Christ, not just a person for entertainment, but one that's willing to serve God at the level that he's called you into because he's called you to do great things for him. In Jesus' name. Merry Christmas. Love you guys.